Um, I was in line in the cafeteria, got my food uh, pulled out, and I looked over hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of faces of people that I did not know. And they were all teenagers. I was speaking for this uh, retreat for all of the teenagers uh, that went to academies in, in California, and they were all, and I think it was at Leone Meadows where this happened, and there were just hundreds of them. There, and I didn't know anybody. And so I'm looking around, where am I going to sit? I don't have a problem making friends. I just wanted to find somewhere to sit. And I looked around, and I saw everybody was sitting together and laughing and talking and throwing little bits of food at each other and laughing some more. And everybody was having a great time. And as I looked around, I saw there was one person, one young lady, that was sitting at a table by herself, and nobody was sitting around her. And I thought, oh, well, now I know where I'm going to sit. So I went and I made my way and I sat right across from her and I sat down and when I sat down, I immediately noticed something was different about this young lady. She had a prosthetic arm. And I looked at her and I said, it seems like everybody has people they're eating with. You're sitting here by yourself. Why? And what she said was, People don't know what to do with the fact that I was born without full arms and hands. So a lot of the time they're nice and everything, but most of the time I feel pretty lonely. And she said, besides that, I think everybody here went to academy together, and, and I'm a public school student, and I came, and I don't know, I don't know anybody. So I did what I do. And if I do this to you, I apologize. Ahead of time, I'm warning you, if there's something different, I'm going to ask what it is. I'm going to ask about it. I looked at her, and she had this, how did you get your prosthetic arm? What happened? Well, I was, I was born like this. And I said, well, how does it work? And she said, you want to hold it? I went, yes. <laughs> she took it off. And she handed it to me, and I'm looking at it, and as we're talking, young people around are starting to watch this, and pretty soon they're bringing their trays over, and they're sliding over closer and closer to us. And pretty soon there's seven or eight young people, and I said, this is fascinating. How do you make it? Because you can grab things, right? And she goes, oh, yeah, and she grabs it and puts it on, and she starts grabbing things. She goes, this is how, and she explained the whole thing, and pretty soon all these people are around, and they're, ooh, ah, can I touch it? Can I hold it? Can I... After that, she had friends, people to eat with for the rest of the weekend, which I was really glad about. Loneliness. Being lonely is awful. I, I don't know if you've ever been lonely before, but if you have, you know what I'm talking about. It's awful. In fact, loneliness was the very first thing that ever went wrong in this world. Very first thing that ever went wrong. I mean, God created uh, puppies and kitties with, with little boys and girls, and, and he created giraffes and heffalumps and woozles, and there was always a mister and a missus, and they were running around. Then he created Adam. And then I guess he forgot or something. Because when you read the biblical narrative, it's like God is talking to himself, you know, the, the, the Trinity, and, and they're like, hey, boy, have you noticed something's wrong with poor old Adam? What do you think it is? <laughs> and Adam's like, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Zebra, Mr. and Mrs. Giraffe, Mr. and Mrs. Whale, Mr. and Mrs. And, and in the biblical narrative, God goes, oh, it's not good that man be, that Hebrew word, lonely. It's not good that man is lonely. Let's make him somebody to occupy his space. And he makes him a partner. 
That's what happens with Adam and Eve. Loneliness can be deadly. We know this because we use loneliness as punishment, don't we? If you're in prison and you're extra bad in prison, where do they put you? Solitary confinement. They put you there and studies have shown if they leave you there for too long, you'll go nuts. When our children are bad, what do we do? We put them in time out. They have to go sit by, with my son, we used to do that. And we used to, we would put him in his bedroom and then we started, we'd hear laughing and, and playing and he was in there playing with all his toys. What kind of punishment is that? So we started putting him in the bathroom. <laughs> Children of Israel in the wilderness, if you were extra, extra naughty and it wasn't a sin that was worthy of being put to death, what did they do? They cast you out of camp so that you had to be by yourself and be lonely. And nobody wants to be lonely. In my very first church, I was, I was so green behind the ear. Do you remember your first church, Pastor Jonathan? you remember your first experience? You kind of didn't know what was happening, but you had so much energy. You were just running around making things happen anyway. I was, I was running down the hallway. I was going down and doing things. And, and, and I noticed as I was going along a woman in a wheelchair. Her name was Sharon. And this woman in this wheelchair had one of those diseases that kind of curls you up a little bit and kind of makes it hard when, when they talk to understand garbled words. And as I was going by this wheelchair, I stopped and I just went, Hey, Sharon! Oh, happy Sabbath, Pastor Mark. Something in me said, talk to Sharon for a minute. The reason I pull up a chair when I go beside people's bedside uh, in, in the hospital is because I'm so tall, I always feel like I'm talking down to people. So I just, I got down on, on my knee and I, and I held Sharon's, uh, the arm of her wheelchair. Sharon, and I did it again and I do this, what puts you in the wheelchair? And she told me about her malady. Sharon, what's the worst thing about being in a wheelchair? You know what she said to me? I thought she was going to say you have to rely on people to, and they have to help you shower and they have to help feed you and, and you can't have the independence. Here's what she said. The hardest part about having this disease, and it was garbled and it took her a long time to get all the words out, is that being in a wheelchair is that people avert their gaze and intentionally don't notice you. It's not because they're bad or because they're mean. It's because it's hard to look at someone like me. The hardest part about being in a wheelchair is you just go unnoticed. I made a special point every Sabbath after that to kneel down and hold Sharon's hand and talk to her, to look at her in the eye and talk to her because there's nothing worse than being lonely. When Jesus came to earth, he spent a lot of time doing a lot of things. He healed people. He preached. He hung out with his disciples. I don't have like all of the same, you know, young people terms that you do, Pastor Jonathan. He hung out with his homies. <laughs> that doesn't sound right from me, does it? No, don't say that. Don't say that. Okay. But when he decided to stand up on the side of a mountain and announce 
everything that he was about. The most important sermon ever preached in human history. Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount. He opens with these oxymoronic statements, these things that just don't make sense. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are you who hunger and thirst. In Luke, it's just when you're hungry. In Matthew, it's when you hunger and thirst for righteousness' sake. You're blessed when you have to be merciful. You're blessed when you're pure in heart, when that's hard to do. You're blessed when you have to be a peacemaker, standing between the living and the dead. Pastors know about being peacemakers. You're blessed when you're persecuted. You know what an oxymoron is, right? You know, you know what that is. Yeah, An oxymoron is, is, is a, a, a statement that, that seems to contradict itself, right? Like... Uh, um, airplane food, <laughs> right? Government intelligence, Microsoft works. Anyway, I'm an Apple guy, sorry. <laughs> Blessed when I mourn? I've mourned before. Have you ever mourned? I mean, really mourned. My wife and son and I um, um, took in a, a foster child that ended up just staying with us after the state was done with her. She was our daughter. Bought her a car, help, was helping her through college. She got really involved in the church. She was our, she was our youth leader in our local church. She was an amazing young lady. I was in Oklahoma speaking at a camp meeting when I got the phone call. There's been an accident. It's a longer story, but, but Megan died very, very unexpectedly. It wrecked me. And it ruined my family. For a year, we couldn't cope. Knocked out of the loop. For the first month after it happened, I couldn't go into work. I was a principal of a, a school at the time. I just sat on my back porch on a rocker swing. I didn't want to talk to anybody. I didn't want to see anybody. I didn't know what to do. My questions, the questions that I was asking God... I almost wondered if, if, if I shouldn't be asking those kinds of questions. I mean, questions like, how could you? And where were you? I was mourning so deeply that tears, they'd flow and flow and flow. And if you ever mourned, you know what this is like. And then, and then they would dry up and then you're just empty. And then the tears would come again, wave after wave. If, if you would have come up to me and said, oh, what a blessing that happened to you. I probably would have tried to punch you in the throat or something. Get out of my house, I would have said. Because I didn't feel blessed. Blessed are you when you feel well, blessed are the peacemakers. Have you ever had to be a peacemaker before? My dad's second marriage. Scott, you remember my dad and Bernadette? Woo! His second marriage. There were times when the fisticuffs were happening and my dad would get black eyes and he'd be going in after my, my stepmom and I'd have to grab him and pick him up and haul him out to the living room and throw him on the couch. I'm going to kill her. No, you're not. <laughs> I'm 19 years old. You know, I'm trying to push him back down, drag him out of the house, keep him away from her. 
during those times of contentiousness, if you would have said, oh, you're so blessed. I can't guarantee the words that would come out of my mouth in response to you would be very Christ-like. But Jesus says all these things. What is he talking about? I'm going to tell you what he's talking about. In every single one of these situations, you're in a bad place and you're having to do something that's hard. Every single one of these, if you know about them. What he's talking about is, he stands up on the side of that mountain and he says, this is who we're going to be from now on. We're going to be this new community. The old is out, the new is in. And what's the new thing? When you're mourning, you're not going to mourn alone anymore. Because this new community is going to come and we're going to mourn with you. Man, we're going to mourn with you. We're going to cry with you. We're going to ache with you. We're going to do this together. When you're being persecuted, you're not going to be persecuted on your own. You're not going to be lonely. No, we're going to stand with you in that persecution because we're the new community. You're not going to be hungry because this community is going to come together and we're going to make sure you have food. When you're standing between the living and the dead and you're trying to make peace, we're going to stand there and we're going to make peace with you because you can't be lonely in these situations anymore. Jesus' antidote, his antidote to all of these things is you not have to go through it alone. We're going to do it with you because we're the new community. Jesus goes on in Matthew chapter 25. And he describes really this very same thing when he talks about the parable of the sheep and the goats, doesn't he? What happens? The, he, he says the, the Lord's going to come and the king's going to come and he's going to separate the world. Sheep and the nations are going to be separated. Sheep and goats. And the sheep are the people that saw somebody that was going through something alone. And they say, no, not in this new community you don't. No, no, no. We're going to come as a church and we're going to gather around you. You're not hungry anymore. You're not naked anymore. You're not in prison without visitors anymore. You're not thirsty anymore. Here we come as a church. We're going to gather around you and we're going to bring you in. And the goats, the ones that go into the, to the goat hole at the end, <laughs> what happened to them? probably a reason they're lonely it's probably a reason they're going through this well they probably brought it on themselves come on let's go to church that's what happens to the goats jesus says no nobody goes through these things as a lonely person anymore we are all in this together in luke chapter 15 You, you, you preached on this just recently. There are three parables. You remember what they are? The parable of the lost coin, the lost sheep, and the lost son. Right? I love this one of the lost sheep. My wife found this image somewhere. You can go to the next slide and show it. The parable of the lost sheep. What happens? The sheep separates from the group and is all alone and lost and wandering. And what does Jesus do? He says, hey, you guys got each other. Keep taking care of each other. I'm going to get up and I'm going to run I'm going to find my sheep because nobody should be alone. And I'm going to bring that sheep. He doesn't just go and visit with the sheep and leave. I'm going to bring that sheep back into the fold where everybody is because nobody should be You can go to the last slide. So here's the thing about Jesus. He looked at who he wanted to hang around. 
And he saw people that were divided. He saw people that were divided by religion. He saw people that were divided by society. He saw people that were divided politically. And he said, here's who I want on my team. Here's who I want to hang out with. I want tax collectors and zealots. They hated each other. Zealots wanted to kill the tax collectors. I want you on my team. I want fishermen and I want another tax collector. I want Judas and I want Thomas, who doubted that he would even be a part of the group. I want all you. And then after we gather together, Let's start eating with some people. Let's get some prostitutes and some lepers. Let's get everybody, like, like let's get the woman at the well so lonely. And Nicodemus, lonely in church. Let's get such a great group of people around the table. In fact, let's give everybody the message that at my table, at my table, there's an empty chair that needs to be filled by every lonely person in the world. And Jesus' message was, I'm going to leave here in a minute. I've shown you what to do. Make a table and bring them in. Parable after parable was about this. Everybody needs a seat at the table. Let's get the Democrats and the Republicans. Let's get the African Americans and the red hat wearing white folk. Let's get gay and straight. Let's get married and divorced. Let's get everybody and make sure they have a seat at the table because nobody should be lonely. Thank you, Jesus, for showing us the way. Forgive us for being so caught up in the divisiveness of this world, political and religious and whatever, that we start making us and them and then we forget that you've prepared for us a table in the presence of our enemies. We forget that the duty of the church is to bring people in, not to indoctrinate them, but to give them a family to be a part of so that nobody is lonely. Give us the courage to stand up, to look around, to bring them in. In Jesus' name.